Okay, let's talk today about common training mistakes and misconceptions in bodybuilding. And believe me, there's a lot of misconceptions, but first a little editorial comment here before I get started. Uh, I go to a very popular gym on the West Coast, Gold's Gym in Venice. Uh, and although I go at a time when it's, it's not particularly crowded, I'm startled every time I go to see how, how many people in the gym have the slightest concept of what constitutes correct training. I mean, the exercises they do are horrible form, uh, and they just, they don't make any progress whatsoever. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the mistakes they make in this video. The thing that gets me is when I began training many years ago, you didn't have a lot of uh, sources to learn how to train. There was a couple of kind of academic books, not popular books on weight training. They were kind of academic, mainly based on on rehabil rehabilitation techniques using resistant, resistance exercise. And of course, you had the bodybuilding magazines. That was the main source of information. But today, the magazines are basically dead, but you have the internet, which has li literally millions and millions of uh, videos and blogs and information about how to, what constitutes correct training. Of course, about 98% <laughs> about of it is garbage and, and wrong. But if you, if you really get a little bit of a background and understand what constitutes correct training, you'll, you'll be able to separate the wheat from the chaff, as they say. So let's go into, in no particular order, let's, let's talk about some of the common training mistakes and misconceptions. Again, this isn't in order, you know, but I'm just going to, off the top of my head, basically. So the first one uh, that <laughs> just gets me every time, after all these years, I mean, I've been working out for close to, well, it's about 58 years. And I, I, I still am always amazed when I see, it's, it's amazing that this is still going on. What I'm talking about is these people that have this idea if they, if they do hundreds of reps of abdominal work every day, every day, every workout, sometimes six, even seven days a week, it's going to give them that nice six-pack cut look and small waist and get rid of all the fat in the abdominal area. That is complete garbage. There's no such thing as spot reducing. When the body burns or oxidizes fat it does so in a systemic manner it doesn't just you know it doesn't just burn if you do sit-ups and leg raises or any type of abdominal exercise the fat's not going to be just locally burned in the abdominal area and nowhere else it doesn't work like that it's systemic the truth of the matter is if you uh if you go on a uh, reduced calorie diet or reduced carbohydrate diet and you do aerobics uh, you can actually bring out your abdominals just as well as if you didn't do a single sit-up or leg raise. I've seen this many times in, in a couple of champion bodybuilders who had great abs and did no ab work at all. All they did is go on a diet and uh, they did aerobics as a fat-burning modality and the abs came right out. You know, I, I mean, the sad part about all this is you still see some people that should know better still suggesting that you do as many as a thousand reps of ab work every day. One of them is a three-time Mr. Olympia who's a otherwise very intelligent guy, but he's giving out extremely poor advice. It's not necessary. It's a waste of time, uh, literally a waste of time, not W-A-I-S-T, W-A-S-T-E. Uh, again, you get the same benefits just by going on a diet, reducing your calories, and if you want to do abdominal work, that's fine, but treat it like any other muscle. I admit I work my abdominals. I work them twice a week. I do a couple of sets of uh, crunch sit-ups, as they call. I used to do leg raises. Uh, however, I have a kind of lower back disc problem, and I find that any type of leg raise seems to irritate it. And besides which, leg raises don't really work the lower abs. That's another myth. The idea that you can isolate your lower abdominals by doing leg raises is a myth. And, uh, and also, another myth is that you need to do direct oblique work. Uh, that's another thing I see. <laughs> I have to laugh. I see guys in the gym and women, they're doing these side bends. They're doing side bends for their obliques, you know, for the so They think it's going to reduce the waist. Actually, what that's going to do is develop the oblique muscles on the side of the torso. And if anything, it's going to give you a thicker waist. As the muscles uh, hypertrophy, hypertrophy or grow, they're going to add width to your waist. So if you want a smaller waist, you don't want to develop huge obliques. And, and what's even worse is they don't even do the exercise right. I see, I see the, 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 a guy will take like a, a dumbbell or a plate and they go like this. This is the movement. They go like this. They're not working anything. 
they're not working a damn thing. Another another wa total wasted exercise for waist is seated twists. With I used to do that when I was uh, uh, when I was a young guy. I would do a believe it or not, 25 minutes as a warm up. I do 25 minutes of seated twists with an empty bar on my neck, uh, and I did that six times a week, and with the idea that it would uh, keep my waist small. Now I had a small waist back then, but it was not from the twists. It was from the diet and the exercise. And uh, even worse, that twisting exercise uh, produces a shearing effect on the spine. And uh, I, I attribute my arthritis in my lower back that I have today to doing, you know, those twists for a couple of years. I did see the twist. Uh, it, again, it doesn't locally burn fat on the obliques, it's, uh, and it's very bad for your lower back. Uh, there's one exception. They have like a seated twist machine where you hold on to these handles and you twist. That's okay, but again, that will develop your obliques unless you use very light weight and do maybe 30, 40 reps. Uh, but it, it's that exercise is not necessary unless you're involved in, let's say, a sport that has a lot of lateral motion where you have to turn to the side a lot. Then it might be a good idea to do a little bit of like oblique work like that seated twist machine. For anyone else, you should know that any time when you work your rectus abdominis, which is the anatomical name of the abdominal muscles, anytime you work there, them, you automatically contract the obliques. You can even feel it when you're doing sit-ups. Put your hand on your obliques, you'll feel them contracting. That's because the obliques support the abdominals. They support the torso, that's their function. So you're automatically working your obliques and when you do any kind of sit-up, crunch sit-up, whatever, you don't need to do direct oblique work. So the first problem is, uh, or the misconception is, you have to work your abdominals every day and do hundreds of reps to burn the fat. Utter nonsense. Another misconception uh, that I see, uh, that I hear, or, well, it's been around for a while, <clears throat> is a lot of guys, uh, women, will avoid any type of aerobic exercise <clears throat> because of the idea that it will burn away muscle. That's utter nonsense. You'd have to do hours of aerobic work to actually affect the muscle. The mechanism of lost muscle when you do aerobics would be twofold. One of them would be an increase in cortisol, which is a catabolic hormone uh, produced in the adrenal cortex that has a catabolic effect on muscle, tends to burn that muscle. Now, cortisol doesn't even begin to rise in aerobic exercise until the 60-minute mark. You know, and, then, and, and it doesn't rise that high. You know, you'd have to do, you'd start to lose muscle if uh, under two conditions, if you're already low in body fat and you do more than an hour and a half of a, a straight aerobics, you probably will lose a little muscle, but that can be prevented if you take in about five, maybe eight grams of branch chain amino acids before about it, about maybe 40 minutes before you do aerobics. The brand, the, 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 uh, the, the, the muscle loss from aerobics comes from branch chain amino acids being pulled out of the muscle by cortisol. But if you give an exogenous source like a branch chain amino acid supplement, it's not going to help you build muscle, but it will have a sparing action on the branch chain amino acids in your muscle. So hopefully it'll spare muscle. That's only if you are doing extremely extended uh, aerobic exercise, which isn't necessary anyway. Personally, I don't think, I think 45 minutes would be the limit for a single aerobic session. And if you do high intensity interval aerobics, you can do 25 minutes if you do it right and it'll be the equal of 90 minutes of steady state aerobics. Uh, so, the, you know, there's the, that's uh, the, the the notion that uh, aerobics uh, will prevent, or will cause muscle loss is another false misconception, uh, except again for super extended aerobics. And let's talk about a, co a couple of other misconceptions. Another uh, another thing is, uh, I, I watched a video of a, of a recent Mr. Olympia. He was showing his shoulder routine and he did three different types of overhead press. He did a seated machine press, he did a seated dumbbell press, and he did a, uh, uh, a uh, barbell, uh, a barbell press beyond the neck, I believe it was. That's absolutely absurd. Now, this guy won several Mr. Olympia titles, but that, uh, while I'm on the subject, this is still another misconception, I'll, I'll do kind of two at once. First, the first misconception is that because a guy won several Mr. Olympia titles or any title, that it's automatically an expert on how to train. And you should watch his videos and duplicate what he does. That's a horrible mistake because anybody who's around any, t any amount of time in bodybuilding knows that genetics plays a huge role in your ultimate results. 
uh, no matter, you know, you could duplicate this guy's workout routine. You could eat the same foods he eats. You could even use the same anabolic steroid program or whatever. You're not going to ever come close to looking like him. Nothing. And, and these guys make a lot of mistakes. Sure, they look great. Yeah, they won a couple of Mr. Olympias, but it wasn't because of their training routines. It was in spite of their training routines. And they could have gotten probably even better results had they used a little more common sense. There's no reason to do three types of pressing exercises in a single shoulder workout. They all work the same part of the shoulder, which is the anterior front part of the deltoid muscle. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and while we're on the shoulders, uh, misconceptions, I should also mention, uh, I still see a lot of people doing front raises, either alternate with dumbbells or with a barbell. Another complete waste of time. You work your anterior, that works your anterior front part of your deltoids. They work thoroughly when you do exercises like pr any kind of press, any kind of bench press, any kind of uh, chest fly. All of them work the anterior deltoids. It's completely unnecessary to work, do front raises. Even worse, when you do the front raises with dumbbells, you tend to cause a shoulder impingement, which will eventually cause a lot of shoulder pain. Uh, it's, a, it's a stupid exercise. It, it's, not needed, it's not needed whatsoever. Uh, as I said, all uh, you, you're constantly working your anterior deltoids with chest work and other exercises. Uh, and uh, while I'm at it, uh, what am I? What was I, was I gonna say? Uh, what was I gonna say? Oh, another uh, uh, two exercises for the shoulders that should always be avoided. I made this mistake myself. Is the seated press behind the neck with either a machine or a uh, or a, a barbell. When you put your arms in this position. But behind your head, you're impinging your shoulders. You're basically shaving away your shoulder joint. It's going to catch up with you. Your any type of impingement of the shoulder is going to cause eventual arthritis and a lot of shoulder pain when you get a little bit older. You're going to pay a heavy price for doing those exercises, and they're not really needed anyway. Another exercise in the same category is upright rows with a close grip. You've seen people doing it like this. They either do a barbell or they do a pulley. Again. Uh, and theoretically, that works the deltoids and the trapezius muscles. Not a good exercise. This is look, look. It's just a shoulder impingement. I did those press bar on the necks very heavy with heavy weight years ago when I, when I was in my 20s. I did a, a upright rows, the narrow grip. Today, I have severe shoulder arthritis to the extent that raising my arm. I, I tried to put a, a, a bar on the lat machine just the other day. I couldn't even hold up the bar because of the shoulder pain. This is the price I pay. So I'm fair warning. If you're going to do heavy presses behind the neck, and heavy, and uh, also if you're going to do uh, upright rows with a close grip, you are going to have shoulder problems. I can absolutely guarantee it. Uh, if you want to do any type of upright row, do what I call the Garanda upright row, which is sh shown to me by the famous trainer Vince Garanda. You take a shoulder with grip, and you and you you just bring the bar right to your lower pec. You don't bring it any higher than that. If you notice the finished position, it, your shoulders are in the same position as a, as a dumbbell lateral raise. It actually helps to beef up the, the uh, lateral head of the deltoid. And that's what you should be working on when you train your shoulders. You should be focusing on the lateral head or the side and the rear. Those are the two sh parts of the shoulder you should focus on. Don't worry about the front deltoids. If you want to do a little press movement, I still do a little press movement just out of habit. I use very light weight. I do it as a kind of a shoulder warm-up. I do like 15, 20 reps, maybe two, three sets. It's just a force of habit. It's not doing a thing for me. I just, I just do it to warm up my arms and shoulders. I focus myself on the, on the lateral deltoids and the rear deltoids. Okay, moving on to another misconception. Squats will destroy your knees. Complete nonsense. There's only one way. Uh, 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 this stems from a study done around 19, in the early 60s by a researcher named Klein who came up with the, this idea that any, that doing squats will break down the knee cartilage. The truth of the matter is, properly done squats, if anything, are very good for the knees because they stimulate the flow of, of, with, of, a, of a type of uh, joint fluid that keeps the inner joint lubricated, synovia fluid it's called, that keeps the joint lubricated and helps to uh, acts as a kind of a buffer and it also helps to prevent arthritis and you stimulate that by doing squats and, and doing exercises for the legs. There's only one way squats will cause a problem. Actually two. 
One is if you do this thing where you go all the way down and bounce at the bottom. You know, you bounce and go up, bounce and go up. If you do that, you will destroy your knee cartilage. That's horrible. The other way is if you bend too far forward, a lot of guys will load up the weight and they look like they're doing what they call a good morning exercise. They're, they're, you know, their torso is almost at a, at a 90 degree angle. That's not so much bad for the knees. It's horrendous for the lower back. You will get a serious lower back injury if you do that. Uh, so the idea that squats are, if you keep it a nice controlled motion, and when, you, when you're lowering into the squat position, go slow, emphasize the negative or the eccentric contraction. That's how you get stronger. You don't get stronger pushing the weight, you get stronger lowering the weight. It's called eccentric or negative contractions. Uh, another myth, calf uh, related to the calves. Uh, to get good calves or build big calves, you have to train calves every workout six days a week. I did this. Again, I'm a victim of that myth. <laughs> when I was in my 20s, uh, a lot of, uh, there was a, a kind of a, a thing in vogue in bodybuilding where a lot of the bodybuilders were doing uh, calf, calf work every day, six days a week. And uh, my calves were a little weak, so I decided to join the crowd. What I did is I did 20 to, 20, 20 to 30 sets of calf work. I think I did three different exercises, did it six days a week. What happened? Well, for the first month or two, it looked like my calves were actually responding, seemed to be growing a little bit. Things changed on the third month. I still remember I was in a kind of a little home gym, uh, and I, I was by myself, and I remember I rolled up my sweatpants because uh, I had just finished training calves. I wanted to see how pumped my calves were, and I was shocked when I looked in the mirror. At first, I thought it was one of those kind of carnival mirrors, trick mirrors, you know, because my calves looked like a polio victim. They looked like it was just bone. There was like no muscle left. I literally burned away my calves from overwork. So the notion that you should train calves every day because they're hard muscle to develop, and they are a hard muscle to develop, but training calves every day is only going to overtrain them. It's not going to, that's nonsensical. If you want to train calves a little bit more often than other muscles, I would say to train calves maximal, maximal, no more than four days a week. Mac, never more than four days a week. I myself, I've trained calves twice a week for many years. After I you know, got back on my normal training, after I destroyed my calves, I went back to training them twice a week. And by the way, uh, just as a, as a note, I got some of my greatest calf growth when I did a routine. It was a high intensity workout routine. But what I did is, I, I the only thing I did for calves was a single dumbbell calf raise, holding a dumbbell one hand and, and you know, lifting your, you know, doing a calf raise. I did that for three sets to failure. And I used fairly moderate to heavy weight, only three sets, and I did that three times a week, and I put an inch on my calves for three sets. So that gives you an idea, uh, you know, if, if you train with intensity. The other thing to remember about calf raise, another major mistake I see, is the guys in the gym will do load up the calf machine or whatever, and they'll do these little tiny calf raises, like two inch, pop, 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 two little, ca you know, they're not even, they're not contracting the calves. What they're doing is working their Achilles tendon, which is not really subject to a lot of growth. They're not doing, and they're not going to get any calf growth at all. You're better off you losing, I mean, using less weight and going all the way down, stretch your heels all the way down and all the way up on your toes. Keep it controlled. Don't do fast movements. And that, if anything, that'll, that'll give you the best calf development. And it is true, calves are largely a genetic muscle. If you don't have the genes for huge calves, you'll probably never get them, no matter how many calf raises or calf routines you do. But anybody, this is an important point, anybody can improve their calves if you train, your, if you train them properly with good form. So these are a couple of uh, misconceptions. Uh, there's many more. But I don't want this video to go too long, so I'll, I'll stop now. If you want more information about training, exercise science, again, how to, prop, how to properly exercise, nutrition, supplement science, which supplements work, which ones don't, uh, hormonal therapy, anti-aging research you can use today, fat loss techniques that really work, women's health and fitness, all of these are covered in my Applied Metabolics newsletter, www.appliedmetabolics.com. Take advantage of my nearly 60 years of constant study and in the trench research in the gym. You'll, you'll learn by my experiences as I kind of related in this video. Subscribe today, www.appliedmetabolics.com. It's 30 to 40 pages every month. No advertisements, pure information. 
Uh, when you subscribe, I'll send you an invitation to join my private Applied Metabolics Facebook page where each uh, day I, I put uh, new information on, on exercise, medicine, and general health. It's only for subscribers. I also have an email portal on my Applied Metabolics webpage where current subscribers only can send me short questions about anything they might have read in Applied Metabolics or anything that comes to mind, and I'll be happy to answer only again for subscribers. I don't answer unsolicited questions. If you have any any uh, subjects you want me to cover, submit them to Generation Iron, and uh, and, I, and I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Just submit them to Generation Iron. They'll be forwarded to me, and I'll make a video about it. Thank you for listening. Take Oh, by the way, if you want to have the best friend you'll ever have, go to your local shelter, adopt a dog. Thank you.